All right. Hello. Welcome to another webinar by BranchTrack. And uh, my name is Sergey. Today we're going to talk about meaningful interactions. We'll try to understand what interactions are meaningful, at least for me, how to define that and how to communicate that to your sponsors. So if sometimes you feel like uh, your courses are a little bit too gimmicky or you have someone on your team who always wants to add this little um, interaction that that takes so much time to build and so much effort and then it's clunky and probably will not survive transitioning your course from one software version to another and it will need maintenance again and so on and so on if you're tired of that then we'll find language that will help you explain to your colleagues sponsors experts sometimes what to do with that and um, uh, we'll also look at a number of interactions. Hopefully you'll like some of them and hopefully you'll dislike some of them. So we're on the same page and so it's going to take us about 30 minutes. Hopefully I try to, to keep this webinar short. And uh, uh, also we are recording this. So if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you. Leave a comment. Uh, feel free to talk to me. And if you're watching this live, even better, thank you for taking a half hour out of your day to join me. If you can hear and see me, I probably should have asked this before. If you can hear and see me, please find the chat button and type a plus or okay or hi, so that I know that I'm uh, not talking into a void here. Cool, excellent. Uh, this is also my little party trick to make sure that everyone finds the chat button and knows how to use that because I want this to be interactive, no pun intended. And uh, uh, please do feel free to ask questions, provide opinions, uh, share an anecdote, if you will, as we speak. And um, now let me share my screen. And I will be sharing my whole screen. Hopefully nothing will go wrong there. Uh, there's also a Q&A button uh, as well for uh, those who are interested. Okay, so today we're talking about meaningful interactions. Uh, we are not talking about branch track. If you're interested in branch track, which is the company that I have founded and that I am currently CEO of, feel free to either join one of our webinars um, that we try to do monthly, at least when we do like general intros or sign up for a personal demo, we'll be happy to chat. Um, just in two words, branch track is a platform which allows you to design and create branching scenarios, scenario based training, uh, conversation simulations online in your browser. Uh, as uh, uh, as an individual developer or as part of a team, and then you can deliver them either through SCORM or embed them into Articulate Storyline. Um, you can you know, like assign points, have leaderboards, you have all the data from playthroughs so that you can build even better scenarios afterwards and so on and so on. Very cool tool. I love it. I've dedicated half my life to it. We're not talking about this today. This is not like a sales promo and there will be no demo as well. Um, I like to ask this question about uh, tools that you use in your daily life. Uh, this webinar has yielded uh, the results where PowerPoint is number one, as always. Storyline and Rise are taking the lead. LMS built-in tools. That's actually interesting. I keep asking this question and um, LMS built-in tools are rising. So that's probably something that we want to explore at a later point. And of course, Captivate and Lectura are there as well. Uh, hi to uh, everyone who's using Lectura. I've spent a lot of time with it uh, years ago. Um, yes, and someone says, uh, Pat says, uh, Riga is a fantastic city. Thank you. If you're here in, in our neck of woods, uh, give me a shout. Um, for branch track friends, beer is free in Riga. Right. So, be, like, without any any kind of theory or explanation or anything, I'm going to show you a number of of uh, interactions, and then we'll rate them. So, uh, pay attention. Let's begin. So, in this one, and this is a template, obviously. 
there's a timeline. You have to click on one of the six bubbles uh, with, with years to progress on over timeline of something from year 1730 to year 1890. And uh, um, obviously, it's a template that you can use and you've probably used a million times for all sorts of uh, corporate training where you, you know, go through a process and so on. You click, you read, you click, you read and, and stuff like that. Um, pretty familiar. Right, this one, this one is a little bit more fun. That's another template from uh, from Dieter, and you can actually buy that, I think, somewhere. It's a tic-tac-toe game, so you have to click different cells, and then you have to answer a true or false question. And then you will have to, uh, well, depending on your answer, if you're correct, you will put a checkbox in there or, or a uh, checkmark or an X, and uh, you have probably get some something like three in a row to get out of this quiz. So that's um, another interaction. Uh, probably not very easy to build as well. And this interaction is one of my favorite. Um, so you have a bunch of balloons and you have a bow and arrow and you have to move your mouse around to shoot the balloons. As you can see, some of the balloons have eye on them. So you will read a piece of information and some of them have a question mark. So there's probably a, a quiz question behind them. So you'll have to deal with the quiz question and you'll have to get 10 points. I'm not really sure uh, if in this case, you only get points for, from quizzes or from correctly answered quizzes, or you also get points for shooting down information balloons, but that's kind of what you need to do as a learner to get through this uh, interaction as, as part of some training course. And again, this is something that you can pay money for and you can customize um, parameters and you can customize uh, text, of course, so you can repurpose it for your own training, you know, be it in healthcare or banking, compliance or safety and so on. Right, this is one uh, like also a very interesting interaction. It's taken from a course built by a Swedish company One Day Interact and uh, they uh, uh, this course is on sustainability. So as one of the exercises, they're trying to explain what sustainability is. And there is a little fisherman who needs to fish out these little fishes out of the lake. And every day you can uh, fish out anywhere between uh, one and 10 fishes. And the next day when the sun sets and the sun rises, you will see that uh, the number of fishes has decreased or increased because, you know, you fished out some, but then the, the rest of the fishes, they multiply, so there will be a little bit more of them. And your goal is to maximize your gain. And very quickly in these little interactions, you will learn that if you try to fish out uh, 10 fishes every day, you'll end up with something like 30 fishes in five days, and that's it. And, and all fish, uh, fishing will, will end simply because there is no fish left. Uh, also, I've never said fish so many times in, in, in a breath of like one minute. So um, the goal is to make sure that you find this optimal balance where you get the most out of it, but also you leave something so that you can get more tomorrow. So that's, that's the idea of the interaction. Um, this is an interaction where it's, uh, um, it's an interactive story. I didn't want to put branch track in it, but this is one of my favorite stories. You can find it on the internet. It's called uh, Toxic Coworker. It's a branching story where you have to deal with a coworker who's not doing everything to, to your liking and you know maybe offering you a massage and you're embarrassed. So what do you do? Uh, do you talk about this? Do you just endure? Do you just, just say no and draw a boundary right there? Uh, depending on what you choose, this whole storyline changes and you know, you'll know you see where it ends. Again, probably took some time to program and write and design, um, all built in storyline, I think. Um, this is one but last. Uh, let me know if you're, if you're following. Um, in this interaction, this is like a um, um, slot machine in Vegas where you can click the refresh button and it shows you three words that you can combine to generate new ideas. 
to brainstorm for things that you can change at your workplace. And this was, I think this was for also maybe a sustainability course or ethics course, something that, you know, it's, it's, it's this little randomizer that allows you to come up with uh, new ideas by essentially pulling boards out of a hat and uh, uh, looking at those new combinations, kind of like a little creative tool. And also, I don't think it collects those sensors. It just allows you to uh, to come up with them. And finally, final this one, uh, I actually built it myself. I think I programmed it in Flash years ago, maybe like 15 years ago when I just started. And this is part of a retail training course for retail employees. and in in this case you have to sort through a number of magazines and newspapers and put them on the shelf that retail chain had a very very strong uh, rule uh, for where everything goes you know as part of that is legal you cannot put uh, adult newspapers and magazines below 160 centimeters that's uh, uh, five feet five i think for you um so that kids cannot reach it and uh, you put the more popular things in here and in there and so like tons of rules that learners had to know and we designed this um, simulator essentially where you just drag them onto this shelf then it tells you what's wrong and not and then you have to like the wrong ones drop off and you have to redo this uh, exercise until you get it right and it times you and scores you and so on um, kind of fun but like Gimmick can also built in Flash. It was before HTML5 was was around. So um, now uh, I will ask you to uh, find the chat button again, not the QA, but use QA if you can find the chat button. And let me know which of these interactions would you consider a waste of time. Let's say they all take the same, let's say, two working days to build and test. Uh, and maybe another day next year when you migrate from this tool to the next tool or maybe the browser version changes and doesn't work anymore. So more or less same couple of days to build and test and um, uh, or you can buy them for a few hundred bucks as a template and, and then spend half a day repurposing this to your liking and integrating. So uh, which one or two or three or six would you consider a waste of time? Just uh, type in chat A, B, C, D or F and I'll get a couple of responses and then I'll... Uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you what my opinion is. So everyone thinks A is pointless. Okay. Especially if it takes that long to build, right? So uh, I think C is falling out of favor quickly. <laughs> uh, F is pointless. Oh, that hurts, but that's all right. That's an opinion. Uh, and we'll talk about how we can, uh, about a framework, how to decide what's what's good and what's not. ADCF, okay, uh, a lot of those. F is... Yeah, well, um, uh, if, if I were, was building F now, probably it wouldn't be in Flash, so we can disregard that. But uh, yeah, okay, so a ton of opinions. Uh, I think everyone has been mentioned. So let's say we are a team of people. Some of you are sponsors asking someone else to build a course, or some of you are the people who will be writing this or building this. And uh, then we also have our uh, almighty CEO who just swoops in and says, look, I've, I've been to a conference. I've seen this very cool uh, little game uh, or, you know, my son is playing uh, uh, this cool little game on mobile. I think we need to include something in our course, which will work like this and shows you something that's totally unattainable within your resources and then just flies away, but you, you need to do something, right? So once you have that dysfunctional team of people, which is very normal, what do you do and how do you uh, hold this conversation about what's meaningful and what's not? And how do you understand for yourself what is, what's meaningful and what's not? Let's talk for the next 15 minutes. All right. So what's meaningful interactions? First of all, I want to mention this person. Uh, some of you know him. Some of you probably know him from my presentations. So uh, I'll give you like 10 seconds to guess. And his first name is Benjamin. 
and his second name is Benjamin Bloom. And uh, did we get something? Yes, excellent job. Thank you. So Benjamin Bloom came up with Bloom's taxonomy, which is a basis for uh, kind of everything we do here in e-learning and learning and development. The idea is very simple. I will not deep dive into Bloom's taxonomy right now. If you want, we can have a separate webinar on that. Maybe it's it's worth doing. But the idea is that on the very basis level of every learning interaction, uh, learning activity, there's there's knowledge, there's passing knowledge from from the teacher to the learner, and then you can also test for this knowledge. Like do you, I told you something. Do you know that now? Yeah, I kind of know. But then, do you really know if you don't really understand? And comprehension, the understanding is the next level. But even if you understand something. Can you actually apply this to actual problem solving, right? So I know, uh, let's say, uh, um, the chemical periodic table by heart. I know all the atomic numbers of everything, and uh, uh, I understand what they mean. But can I solve a chemistry equation? I don't know, probably not. Um, I, I can also not build anything or mix anything and so on, but I do have this comprehension. So that's next level is application. Are you able to use this knowledge? And then it's analysis and synthesis where you can actually break down the problem into pieces and then you can assemble different pieces into, into a solution. And then you can also on, on the top of it, you can evaluate like, is this solution going to work? If it worked, was it good or not? And so on. Like if we apply this to business, we can see how kind of our professionalism at our job grows from the roots things of like understanding what SCORM is, for example, and being able to like download a SCORM file from a tool that we like to being able to debug SCORM or even at some point understand that SCORM is not the good format for what we're trying to do, for example. Right. So, um, and I think the good interaction should at least touch on this green level of application. Like if your interaction just merely sits da down there in the knowledge check, in the quiz realm of learning, that's not a very meaningful interaction. And if you've spent any considerable amount of time building this, then this is probably a waste of resources. So I've tried to formulate this into three E's. It's way less than the whole taxonomy. So just three E's, easy enough to communicate to a CEO or a subject matter expert. So they are experience, error, and emotion. Three things, three kind of checkpoints for your interaction um, that you can have conversations around. And then uh, we'll, we'll do an exercise at the very end with the existing interactions as well. So first of all, experience, right? When I talk about experience, I'm talking about the fact that a good interaction, the meaningful interaction will try to simulate maybe in the most simplistic way, the work experience or the life experience, job experience of the learner. It does not have to be very complex. It does not have to be like a VR tank that you drive around. Uh, it doesn't have to be a complex simulation of your whole logistics or supply chain. It can be very, very simple. But if you're spending time on simulating a process and your learner's daily job is not shooting things with arrows, do not spend time and resources on emulating the shooting of arrows or car chases or spinning wheels of fortune or anything like that. It seems fun. It might be even perceived as fun by learners, but generally it's not meaningful. And if you have this resource to spend, spend it on something more meaningful than that. And in my opinion, more meaningful means closer to the actual work experience of a learner. Um, like I said, doesn't have to be very difficult. Here's a scenario that uh, I often quote that's from Short Sims Collection by Clark Aldrich. You can easily Google that. Um, uh, it's a collection of very cool short stories built with branch track, but just as easily you could build them with uh, PowerPoint. You'll probably get lost in the web of connections within that PowerPoint, but um, uh, branch track is still better, but yeah, you could. So, um, error. Um, by this, I mean that you have to let your learners make mistakes. Very often I see a lot of interactions where 
um, you cannot make a mistake. Like every time you you click a wrong balloon or you click a wrong button, it just tells you mm, wrong. Click another button. Um, like when you need to connect a, a verb to a definition, which is also a terrible idea for interaction, by the way, because in real life, most people do not connect uh, uh, um, objects to definitions of those objects or like terminology to, to their definitions or something like that. Uh, but um, uh, just as an example, if, if you do something, and then you're wrong, it just tells you mm, wrong and, and you have to redo, redo it again immediately. Uh, at the very least, let people work out the uh, uh, interaction till the very end. Like, for example, if we return to that example with putting magazines on the shelves, we had two versions of that and we play tested those two versions. In version one, you had to put the magazine on uh, on the shelf and then you click check if it's in the wrong place it will kind of you will lose a point and then if it's the right place it sticks you get it it's, it's highlighted in green you get a check mark you get a point and you have to get them all in place stuff like that and then if you can't do that you can reset and start from from scratch kind of a little bit like quiz but in the other version, we had this uh, process where you put everything to the best of your ability and then click check once you're done. So you, you kind of, you, you, you put them in, you try to look at that. You might even uh, uh, go back to, like, if you understand that you, you, you don't remember this rule at all, you can go back a few slides, look at, uh, at the rule and then go back. You can make notes if you like, you know, you, you. but the idea is that you do your job and then you're checked and, in, and, and then the wrong ones just fall off and you have to do, redo the wrong part. We found out in, in play testing that the second option was less frustrating and more uh, like it yielded better results. People got the hang of what goes where way, way faster because it resembled their work uh, experience much more than this like checking just by one magazine and uh, allowed them to make mistakes and correct their own mistakes and see their own mistakes instead of just stopping them and saying this is wrong before their brain cells even activated. Uh, if you try to think how you would train someone to, I don't know, clean a coffee machine, um, or let's say you don't know how to clean a coffee machine, uh, let me put you in the shoes of that person, and you have someone showing you the ropes, and you start doing something, and they say, no, 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 no stop, you're doing it wrong, do something, like, you have to do it like that, and you're like, okay, okay, let me try, and you start doing it, and then, and then they shout at you, okay, stop, like, you can't do that. And, and then it repeats over and over. It's frustrating. You don't learn anything. Instead, you can try and like do something and like you figure it out. And if you can't figure it out, you can ask for help or, you know, a good trainer will like look in and say, hey, hey like you, you're doing fine, but that one thing goes in, in the reverse order. Otherwise, you know, you will find coffee all on the floor. So uh, I don't know now I'm getting like flashbacks of my father teaching me how to drive when I was 16, uh, which was the first option very much the first option. So the idea is that a meaningful interaction, a good interaction will give you a chance to make mistakes without being too invasive. Uh, and uh, uh, ideally, it will show you the mistakes that you make. Uh, by the way, why I have this example on, on my screen right now is because it's the uh, Will You Fit Onto Deloitte, very famous interactive scenario uh, built by Wrapped Media uh, years ago for Deloitte New Zealand, I think. And it's a series of funny situations at work. You're first, it's, it's your first day at work and you have to make decisions all the time. Like you spill coffee on someone uh, and, and, and like, what do you do? Or you forgot your meeting notes and you came to the meeting without the notes. Like, what do you do? Do you wing it? Do you say, okay, I'm going to be back in 15 minutes with my notes or let's talk about it. like, and so on. But then instead of just saying something like, no, you can't do that. It actually shows what happens if you make that choice. If you decide to lie to a manager, what, what happens in the end, right? If you decide to stall client for 15 minutes, what, what happens? And then in the end, since you're an adult, you will understand yourself 
what it is like was it good or bad and this is how you elevate up that bloom's taxonomy so error is a crucial part of that all right so that's that's number two number three the third e is emotion i think meaningful interactions if you are spending any time on designing that writing that thinking about that you have to consider the emotional side of that we often focus just on the knowledge just on the things that the learners need to learn on things that our learners need to do and we forget about how learners need to feel um, sometimes it's just it, that the emotion acts like a grease for uh, for your learning to really slide into their brains and like really make make everything work and you know the cogs turn but also uh, sometimes emotion can be the actual learning goal. Sometimes you want people to feel um, more, um, uh, more, more, more sure of themselves, like more confident um, when they're selling something or, or when they're picking up a phone to call someone. Some, sometimes you train people to be more assertive. That's an emotion as well. Sometimes you want people to get scared and kind of be afraid of things that they didn't know were important but now they know and because they are now scared of making a mistake because you know it, it can cost way more than they thought before be it in aviation or bank finance so um that's the idea okay uh, chat is exploding let me check can we search this interactive stories on the internet to learn more uh well first of all yes definitely and second of all um I, since we do a follow-up on uh, on every webinar with the recording, I will also make sure that um, I will share the titles and if I can find the direct links, I will do that as well. Um, right, so uh, emotion can be both uh, kind of uh, uh, an oil degrees for the machine of learning and can it also be a, a goal uh, in, a, in and of itself. Um, this example is from a simulation of becoming homeless where guys at uh, uh, HI lab at Stanford University a few years ago uh, created two simulations of uh, you being in the shoes of a homeless person. One was virtual, one was um, uh, text-based, I think. And the result was quite interesting. So first of all, you can try and guess this. So first of all, um, they measured how much empathy you felt for homeless people before and after uh, the simulation and the impact of just a normal PC, like text best training versus a virtual experience. Which one do you think was more impactful? Which one do you think made people more um, like feel for, for homeless people, feel more empathy? Okay, bets, virtual, okay, virtual. Okay, we, we might have a consensus here and you are correct. Now, the other question is, once they asked people who went through the training to donate money to the good cause of, you know, reducing homelessness in, uh, uh, I don't know, LA maybe if we're talking Stanford, and uh, what were the results? which group the pc group with the normal learning or the virtual group with the virtual vr learning which one do you think donated more again everyone agrees on virtual the truth is that it was the same like there was no statistically important difference in the amount of money and propensity to um uh, to do that, <laughs> to 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 contribute money, but uh, I think that that just speaks to kind of Kirkpatrick and us, uh, lear uh, like learning professionals, always looking at uh, not just learning outcomes, but uh, also at, um, uh, at at the actual world impact, right? So, did our learning reduce something, increase something in real life? So, in this case. Um, after that experiment, if I had to like really launch this campaign, I would probably go with the cheaper one. You know, if 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 it brings you know same results in terms of money, even though the empathy changes. But you know, that's that's just a very basic experiment. You can read into details of that. 
uh, I will I will provide the links for that uh, later. And of course, I don't know the quality of uh, uh, equipment maybe changes things. The quality of writing may change things as well, and so on. Right. And now on on the emotion side, I just wanted to mention one more thing uh, with regards to VR. Uh, there was a, a different group of researchers which researched uh, whether in VR is better at eliciting emotions than uh, uh, like normal desktop uh, activity. They were not uh, looking at uh, training specifically, but they were just trying to essentially uh, scare people or make them angry. And they found out that so you can see what you what you have to look at. Uh, is that on the left hand side the orange spike above the blue uh, is like twice or, or almost three times larger two and a half times larger than the blue baseline in vr and it's just maybe like 50 percent 80 percent larger uh, on the right hand side for the desktop so compared to baseline level of emotions and panas x is like a standardized way to measure emotions um so the virtual reality elicits like bigger response you know if you ever played like a scary game my, my son is, a, is is crazy about virtual reality and horror games <laughs> and things that he plays and and has fun with you know i i, I can't really stomach it's it's really uh like jump scares and whatnot so yeah uh definitely and i can kind of more or less play them on desktop so yeah virtual games are scarier virtual experiences are scarier or make you more angry or make you happier or make you more invested and engaged and and, and believable and so on so vr has this additional impact if someone asks you like should we build this thing in vr you can say yep we will get more emotion out of those people but uh, then you also have to look at the real results but anyhow to wrap this up I think that um, emotion is a crucial component of uh, three E's in um, uh, in in uh, learning, and uh, these three components will help you have a more meaningful conversation about any interaction that someone is trying to uh, ask you build or spend your budget on building or or spend any time and so on. Um, and you will uh, uh, be able to like dissect anything and just have this meaningful <laughs> didn't mean to, to 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 have this pun but a more meaningful conversation about this so you'll say okay well what you're offering like does it resemble the work experience or the on the job experience of our learners no then why are we building this okay it looks cool but Maybe we sp the money is better spent elsewhere. Same with mistakes. Like, why are we so didactic? Why are we so in their face? Like, do we, if we're building something interactive, let them play with it and like make their own mistakes to learn from it. And finally, emotion. Like, think about it. How does this interaction make them feel? Just asking this question is already enough in many, many cases. You will say, okay, we want them to be. Uh, 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 more confident or we want them to be more empathetic or we want them to be this or that and that already influences decision making around uh, design choices writing uh, uh, visual style and and so on and so on so that uh, uh, i think and it helped me many many times in my e-learning development career before to have better conversations with people who not who aren't necessarily instructional designers and learning professionals, but they still have a lot of say in what we do and what we have to deal with unless we can put it out, uh, put this fire out in the very beginning. Right, so that's that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if we have, let me see. Well, we have five minutes time, so I wanted to maybe touch quickly on, on two slides that uh, uh, that I have here as well. One is this Brandon Hall group um, research from a couple of years ago during the pandemic. They asked companies what are the critical skills, uh, soft critical skills uh, for your managers and the top ranked were critical thinking, innovation and emotional intelligence, essentially kindness. You know, we we went on on, on all those 
rather hard lockdowns and hybrid works and and, and and stress and so on. And we found out that better performing teams uh, were the ones that had emotional intelligence. And emotion emotional intelligence is not something that you learn by quiz. It's something that you learn by doing, by immersing yourself in situations, by uh, going through simulations and scenarios which are very of your emotional state as well. So um, this is just another illustration to the importance of emotion to uh, a good interaction, and good learning in general. And um, um, also, I wanted to like really qu quickly touch on why why we don't build meaningful scenarios enough. Uh, maybe something will resonate with you, and you can fix that in your processes or um, kind of persuade someone in charge. Uh, to, to improve on that. So first of all, yes, it requires effort. It requires more resources that we don't always have, but I think sometimes we do have those resources. We just don't spend them in the correct place. Sometimes it's lack of motivation, and I hope I motivated you today a little bit to do that. And I've shown you the difference between good and bad. Um, there's uh, not enough skills, uh, It's but it's a learnable skill. And, you know, having three E's as a starting like as a stepping stone is already great. Um, also, I think the formal education approach to this is is not really great. And uh, um, like this didactic approach is very, very detrimental to building meaningful interactions. So if you have academia involved, be aware. And finally, there are no best practices, but this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show you things which work and don't work, tell my stories uh, in, in these webinars related to scenarios, not related to scenarios, about branch track, about other learning, about other tools as well. So um, hopefully that was useful. That was useful and uh, I will uh, email you the links and the recording as well. This is being recorded um, in uh, in a couple of days. And stay tuned for for our next webinars. We try to do them every week at this time. Thank you for spending thirty to forty minutes with me. I hope your lunch break went well. And uh, yeah, thanks and have a great day. See you soon. And thanks for the good words. I really appreciate it.